Hello, this is Bill with Nordic APIs. This is our first live cast part to a new series of live meetings with core community members from Nordic APIs. And today we're going to talk all about API security. So hopefully we're, we're going to keep it to around an hour. Uh, we've got Deskog of Curity. He's going to give of pairing OAuth with OpenID Connect. So we're going to uh, have a deep dive into that. Um, and then followed by um, Christopher Sandoval. He's going to be talking about security in the Internet of Things, focusing on a very niche topic of medical grade security. Um, so first off, for listeners who might not be familiar with us, Nordic APIs, we are an international community of API practitioners and enthusiasts. We're based in Sweden and we've been hosting API related events for some time now on a nice, uh, pretty high impact blog. We've, we're reaching around 100,000 page views uh, a month. So the community is uh, growing, which we're really excited about publishing eBooks on very specialized topics. For 2018, we've already got our annual platform summit scheduled. So put that in your calendar for October 22nd through the 24th. That's going to be in Stockholm. And we're also working on another event, which we're excited about. It's going to be in Austin, Texas. So this is our second API event in the United States. Um, we'd love your help trying to events. So please take our survey that is located at the Nordic APIs homepage. And we're offering a 15% off next Nordic APIs ticket. So, so we have a newsletter that is uh, curated by weekly digest of critical API insights. Um, I personally managed that and up to that newsletter for some uh, additional content outside of this presentation. We're also putting together ebooks on um, specific topics, like I mentioned, and we're working on a release for GraphQL, which should be next uh, week. So that ebook is going to be all on that topic. We have plenty more, for all free to download, if you visit nordicapis.com and go to our ebook page. Uh, one piece of content that's going to be really familiar for this presentation is securing the API stronghold. So today, go give this a read. Um, it's going to dive into the, all the topics a little bit further. So why do we focus on API security for our first live cast? Well, in general, security is a topic that's sort of underappreciated in the API world. Um, there's not too much knowledge shared about best practices. Often are the tabloids and the exploits from major vulnerabilities, DDoS attacks. You hear what happens afterward. So we want to uh, ignite discussion on how to prepare so that nothing like that ever happens. There's not that many experts in this field and it's something that's really important because it really affects the entire industry. So when we talk about API security, we've mentioned four aspects of that. One being authentication. So how do we confirm the identity of the user? The next being authorization. How do we uh, confirm certain user access levels and permissions? Maybe only in the beginning. We need a method for federating and delegating these credentials across different services. There are there have been a lot of different strategies um, 
to secure APIs, API gateways, using rate limiting, um, a combination of open standards or often fueling. Um, really, when it comes down to it, testing and debugging is highly critical. For common strategies like HTT basic auth and using API keys. But as we've covered on the blog before, API keys don't equal complete security. Even though it's the most common method, you can't rely on the developer to hold their key and not make it public. We need our robust identity management solutions. And that's where OAuth and OpenID Connect and other uh, interesting standards come into play. So that's my high level take on API security. And now we're gonna hear from Jakob E. Deskog on a little bit more of a, an introduction to OAuth and OpenID Connect. So for our presentations today, please uh, keep your questions in mind. I believe there is a chat feature on the video where you can input questions um, or just comment below. So yeah, we're well, happy to take that. And here we go. We'll switch things over to Jakob now. Thank you, Bill. Let me see if I can start my presentation also. All right. I hope you guys can see my my screen sharing now. Um, so my name is Jakob Ideskog. Um, I work at Curity, which is an identity company. We work with OAuth and OpenID Connect daily. Um, try to solve the architectural problem of, of API security, which is um, something that, that you have to keep in mind. Just building microservices or deploying new new APIs, it, it doesn't scale if you don't set the architecture right. And using security with OpenID Connect and OAuth the right way can really leverage your uh, or increase your, your time to market and make it easier to sort of deploy uh, your APIs swiftly. Uh, so what we try to do is we try to take the architectural approach of this and, and sort of tie in all of these bits and pieces to, to create a holistic view of, of what, you're, what you're trying to achieve. So I'm just going to dive in a bit to OAuth today. Uh, I usually start with some a bit of a crash course in OAuth. It's, it's always good. And then I'm going to just tie in a bit on what OpenID Connect is. Why, why does that come into play? Um, so that, that's what we're going to dive into. Uh, so let's just start right in. Um, quickly a recap of OAuth then. OAuth is a standard that came, I think it was finished 2013, OAuth 2.0, which is the one we, we talk about when we say OAuth. And it is, it is a centralization of how we sort of provide access to services. So the whole point is we want a user to use an app that can access data in some API. And we want all of these things to be decoupled. We don't want the user to give its password to the app. We want it to give it to some, someone who trusts, someone we trust. Um, and we want the API to simply depend on this trust. Um, and especially when we talk about microservices, because we're going to have so many. So we don't want them to have to bother about security too much. We want them to be using some reusable library. We want to be able to swap authentication methods as we go. Maybe want to use Facebook or Google or username password or two-factor, three-factor, whatever. And our APIs shouldn't care. So OAuth can do this for us. Um, and OAuth has four actors. And I usually drive, draw five, because it actually makes sense. And you'll see why. Uh, we have the resource owner, the user. We have the client, who's the, the app or the website or the server. Uh, we have an authorization server. Now, that's, that's the fancy name for the OAuth server. And then we have the resource server, which is the API. And the fifth hidden guy here is the authentication server. I usually add that, because 
authentication is all about answering the question who you are. And OAuth explicitly says, we don't answer the question who you are, we just delegate the information. And you'll see why. So it's, use, it's usually a good idea to keep this in mind and actually draw that in the picture to see the whole picture. So what we need to do, we want a client, in this case the mobile application, to access data on the resource server. So in order to do that, we get the client to call the OAuth server the first thing it does. And uh, that's called an access request. And the response of that is that the authorization service says, fine, but I have no idea who you are. I don't know who the user is. I need someone to authenticate the user for me. So it relays this up to an authentication server. And in turn, that one will pick a method of authentication. And perhaps it's just a, a username password form that the user has to fill in. So the user is presented with a means of login here. And once the user has authenticated, this can be many methods. It doesn't have to be a single factor either. But once that's done, the authentication server responds to the, to the OAuth server. And the OAuth server then issues an access token. This access token is sent to the client. And the client can then use that to call the resource server, the API. So, the API, when it gets an access token, it really doesn't know anything about the access token. Uh, in, in the most common way of OAuth, the access token is just a plain string. So it needs to ask the authorization server again, or the OAuth server, what is this? Is this something I can use? What's, what does it say? And the authorization server responds, yeah, it says, uh, this is Jacob. Um, and Jacob has authorized this app to, to, to access the emails on this API. So the resource server says, oh, that's great. I'll just respond with these emails. As you saw here in this flow, the authorization server becomes sort of the central component. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of you are thinking that seems a bit unnecessary. A lot of requests going back and forth. And, and yes, of course, this is the, the sort of uh, blueprint of how it's done. Then in real world, it's done in, in more detail with more, more optimizations here and there. But the interesting part of what just happened is that the user presented itself to the authorization server and the authentication server. It never presented itself to the, to the application, to the client. So there was never an opportunity for the client to steal the password or to, to somehow you know, fetch information about the user that perhaps wasn't intended for it to know. So by using this access token approach, uh, the client is simply given a token that it's supposed to send further on. And it can't even decode it. It doesn't even know what it says. All it knows is, if I use this, I'll get the data that I can use to show to the user. And that, that's kind of one of the goals of OAuth, to sort of separate these things so that we can open up our APIs and have, um, and have users in our own systems uh, authenticate to apps that we didn't make and that they, those apps can still use our own APIs. Yeah, it's a bit uh, complex, but it's very, very handy once you get this right. So as I said, this was the blueprint. So in the real world, we have two types of tokens. Um, I call them by value tokens and by reference tokens. And as I said, in this, this previous picture, the API didn't really know what the token was. And that was because it was a reference token. A reference token is just like a pointer. It, it has, it's, a, it's a, unified, a unique identifier that can be used to look up some data in the OAuth server. So you cannot decode it without calling the OAuth server. Uh, meaning a by reference token contains no information when it's passed out in the wild. So if you send that on the internet, nobody can actually figure anything out. You can't leak information when you're sending these tokens around. And that can be quite useful. On the other hand, the by value token, you've probably heard of them. They're, they're called JOTs mostly. They're not necessarily JOTs. They can be other types of tokens as well. Uh, I call it JOT, but JWT or JSON Web Token is the, uh, the formal name for it. Um, they're by value. They contain all necessary information that the API would need. To, to know what it should do or who the user is and so on. A JSON web token, that's, that's a JSON document 
that is signed by a certificate or by a private key uh, and that signature is added to the token. So the token contains of three parts. It has a header, as you can see in the top here, where it has some information of who made this token, the issuer, uh, what kind of token is it, how is it signed, what algorithm, and so on. <clears throat> and then a body where it has the actual useful information, like who is who is logged in, what's the email, phone number, etc. All of these things. When can it be used? When does it expire? And then in the end, you tag on the signature that signs these two first parts. And when you send that around, you don't have to call the NOAA server to figure out if this is a, a token that is valid or not. You can simply check the signature using the public key of the OAuth server, um, or the public key of the issuer, I should say, because they're not necessarily sent by an OAuth server. And then you know, OK, yeah, this is a valid token. It's for me. It has this information. I can start to use it. So in the real world, you try to sort of split this. Um, there's an external world and an internal world. And when you build microservices, for instance, you usually end up with tons and tons of APIs. And when you do that, you usually also end up with a, some sort of entry point into the network, a firewall or a reverse proxy or something like that. Uh, so what you do then is you, you have the OAuth server issue reference tokens that are sent on the external network, the internet. And then on the internal network, you translate this token into a, a by value. So you have somebody, you um, dereference the external token and make it into a, a JOT token that you send back to the API. So the API never have to call the OWA server to figure out what the token is. And then obviously this reverse proxy or firewall can, can cache this and, and optimize the, the incoming requests. So the, we call this a phantom token because we usually think of it as it should be the same content, the same expiration, the same information in the token on the external network as in the internal network. And um, gives you sort of a handy way and a quick way to, to optimize your microservice infrastructure. So then the question is, what does the API really need? So this talk was going to be OAuth, but adding OpenID Connect on it. And we're doing it in 15 minutes. So it's, it's kind of diving in quickly here. So what can OpenID Connect add? And OpenID Connect is, is built on top of OAuth. That's the first thing you need to know. So you cannot ever have OpenID Connect without having OAuth. They go hand in hand. But you can have OAuth without having OpenID Connect. So it's, it's the identity layer on top of OAuth. It adds stuff. So mostly it adds stuff for the client, for the, for the web application or for the um, mobile application or something like that. But it also adds stuff for the API that can be useful. So in the back end, when we send this token back to the API, the token perhaps contains subject equals Jacob and a few more things, email, blah, blah. But it probably doesn't contain stuff that is more specific to what this particular API needs to know. I mean, you want to try to keep the size of this JSON web token in a reasonable, uh, in a reasonable size. You probably have 10 attributes or 15 attributes in it. But if you need more, shoe size, hair color, you know, whatever, you, you don't want to stick it in the token because it's not used by most APIs. Um, oh, yeah, I went ahead of myself there. But what we also said. Uh, before I go further on that track, is that it's a signed JSON document. So how do you know if it's signed? Who who is it signed by, and how do you validate that signature? Uh, a thing that came in OpenID Connect is something called JSON Web Key Service. It's an endpoint that an OpenID server can expose uh, that publishes all the active keys of your system. So you can take a key ID. Um, that a token contains. Uh, any JOT that is signed by this type of key has a KID in the beginning of it, in the header. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five. So all you do is you call the JSON web key set endpoint, and it will respond with all the public keys that that server has. So then you just look up, is there a key with one, two, three, four, five? Yes, it is. Oh, great. I'll just check the signature with that. And uh, if that's a valid signature, then you know it came from that OAuth server, and it's valid, and it's for me, et cetera. And if you get a cache miss, well, 
then that probably means uh, somebody updated the keys on the webs on the OWA server. So just go there again, check is there new keys there. So this helps you a lot when you want to manage key rotation and key distribution in your network. Very very good when you have a microservice uh, based architecture. So put this in your in your notes. JSON web key set. It solves all these painful uh, key distribution issues we've had uh, previously, where you distribute certs on machines and all of that. But as I was sort of starting saying before, the, the token data that the, this access token contains, subject Jacob, that may not be enough. Uh, you might want to know other things. And for that purpose, we can, we can request some extra scopes when we start getting the token. So either the client asks for it and says, I want an open ID scope and I want a profile scope, or the OA server simply adds them on top of what the client asked for. Both are actually valid from an OAuth perspective and an open ID perspective. And what then happens is that the token comes in to the API containing these scopes. If they do, if it has those scopes, the API can call another endpoint, which is also an open ID endpoint called the user info endpoint. Uh, the user info endpoint is kind of an extension of, of what we know about the user. So when it sees an access token that has the appropriate scopes, it can respond with more information about that user than that token contained. Stuff like what kind of account does this user have or you know, what, what email, what shoe size, all of these things that you don't normally perhaps stick in your token. So calling user info is a standard way of having sort of a, a source of truth when it comes to your user. So that's also an OpenID Connect ad addition. So mostly OpenID Connect actually adds stuff for the client. But since we're talking Nordic APIs and APIs, I thought it was interesting to see what OpenID adds for, for the API and the backend. So it adds the identity information in the user info endpoint. But it also adds uh, key distribution or public key distribution using the JWKS or JSON web key set endpoint. Um, so both of those you should look for in your when you deploy your next uh, OAuth and OpenID server. That was my quick deep dive here <laughs> into OAuth and OpenID. Let's see if I can end this this show here. Oops. Um, that's a lot to fit into 15 minutes. It seems like it's really only scratching the surface. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't think we have. Yeah, I'll just open the table if anyone is uh, viewing our live cast currently for any questions. Uh, but I'll kind of take things. We can have a little little talk session here. Um, some people coming in, they don't really understand OAuth. They might be familiar with the term. Um, they might see a lot of things about uh, user identity. Um, that you're talking about in your presentation. So how do you bridge the gap to with who are completely unfamiliar with this? Um, how do you, can you explain why this is important and why identity is important for securing APIs? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, when we say identity, uh, we mean something that represents a user. And when we need to say represent the user, we need to do it in a way where we can trust it. So we need to know, is this, is this true, what you're telling me about this user? And uh, in order to do that, uh, the OAuth architecture puts a central point of trust in your network where, where you can ask questions and it will issue tickets, we call them, or tokens that contain relevant information about the user. And when you do that, all your APIs that you deploy, they don't really have to like connect to your LDAP system or connect to do basic authentication and, and worry about passwords or secrets or anything like that. All they need to do is receive this ticket and check, oh, it says Jacob, and it says it has these permissions or these things. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. So you vastly simplify your <clears throat> the security layer on your APIs. And you move that complexity to, to one point instead that the one who issues these things. So it, it's really just a matter of moving the complexity around a bit and, and sort of uh, 
centralizing trust, which is which is key here. And decoupling it, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also, we're talking about how this is solving like an architectural issue. So, do we run into any unique OAuth flows when we're working in different architectural arrangements, like Internet of Things or microservices? I mean, absolutely. In those approaches. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 many flows in OAuth. So we we just scratched the surface here. Um, OAuth. The the idea of OAuth is that somebody issues the ticket. OAuth, the OAuth service issues the ticket. But how that was done, I mean, if you're logging into your TV, for instance, you, you probably don't want to use a flow where you have to sit with your remote and, and, and you know type in stuff. You probably want a flow that sort of pings your phone instead and you log in there and it in the TV just figures that out. Uh, or when you're logging right. to um, yeah, you know, a mobile phone, you don't want to use the same way as if you log into a website. So there's all kinds of flavors on these flows. Uh, but for the from the API's perspective, it really doesn't care. It will always get a token. So yeah, I mean, the decoupling is is really key here, like that. Cool. Well, I'll keep it at that for now. Uh, we're kind of pressed for time. But Jakob is a core Nordic API's member. Um, He's done a lot of great talks on this subject. So if you're interested in learning more about this, check out our YouTube videos. Um, also, we've done some articles that dive even deeper on the North API's blog. So uh, we'll wrap it up for his presentation right now. Thanks for sharing a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I'll switch things over to Christopher. Let me go ahead and screen share. <clears throat> And for those of you who are familiar, Christopher is an avid Nordic APIs blogger uh, for the last couple of years now, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, my name is Christopher. I'm, like uh, Bill said, I uh, blog for Nordic APIs, and I'm also kind of an academic uh, specifically focusing in security. So this is definitely a, a field that I'm very passionate about. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, basically the security, morality, and future of the IoT um, summarized within securing medical grade um, IoT devices. So to kind of set the stage about uh, what we're talking about and why this is such an important topic, the when we think about IoT medical devices, a lot of the time we tend to think about kind of the, the, the early stages of that. Um, but the reality is that medical devices today are so much more powerful, but also are more potentially dangerous. Um, there are devices that connect to prosthetic limbs to sensor um, feeling. There are pacemakers that have wireless interfaces for configuration. And all of these things, while they leverage the IoT and they make uh, certainly the devices more powerful, you also have the potential for abuse, especially with something that connects to like the heart, you know, a direct connection to the heart, being able to set how often those, you know, low voltage jolts happen and, and things like that. There's definite, um, you know, definite risks with that kind of technology. And this is actually a problem that is becoming more well known. Um, as an example of that, in August of this year, there was a major pacemaker manufacturer that issued an open letter that basically said, uh, we have 465,000 patients that are implanted with the specific pacemaker, and we have found that the security behind this pacemaker and, and the connections with other devices um, are actually exposed. And their letter specifically said if there were a successful attack, an unauthorized individual could gain access and issue commands um, to modify device settings or impact functionality, which basically means they could they could really harm someone. So there's three kind of considerations when we're talking about securing medical grade IoT. Um, there's the moral consideration, of course, that you know these people are depending on these devices to live. These aren't our smartphones. They're not our you know ordering buttons for online orders. These are things that keep people alive, and theoretically could you know do the other thing as well. They could easily kill if if used incorrectly. And as an industry, we very much have kind of what I always go back to the industrial revolution. We had these amazing technologies that came to the forefront, but we weren't really prepared for the impact of those technologies, for pollution concerns, for you know uh, personal concerns of, of safety to people. 
And it's the same thing with these IoT devices. We really need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that these devices are as dangerous as they are and kind of tread lightly. There's, of course, the legal concerns. These are especially uh, important for API providers. There's a lot of regulations like HIPAA and high tech that are very clear in the medical environment. Um, very, very high economic impact for violating those. There's also FDA regulations, uh, privacy policies for governmental organizations. There's a lot of legal concerns. And of course, the focus for this is the technical security concerns. Um, these can these concerns really kind of go over a broad uh, broad range of topics. Um, we can start with things like passive exposure of just you know passively sending off data. This could be collected and used for advertising purposes for very very simple kind of like non threatening uh, purposes. And then it ranges all the way to the upper end, which is things like the uh, future attacks. And so as an example of a future attack, there is a sensor being designed for prosthetic limbs that mimics the feeling of pain. And it's basically a smart skin. Um, in theory, you could overload that endpoint with just fuzz data, basically, and cause a pain sensory overload on the person. And so you're talking about someone driving down the road with a prosthetic limb in the future. In theory, if we don't secure our APIs well enough, that person could have just entire body overwhelming pain. And that is definitely, this isn't, you know, this sounds science fiction, but it's, it's possible. So how do we fix this? Uh, we basically need to take a layered approach. And with, with almost any uh, technical system, a layered approach is going to be the best, but especially in terms of APIs, because the API basically exists in multiple layers uh, kind of, of our network uh, use case. So the first thing we have to look at is organizational security. Before we even start looking at uh, any of the you know, protocols or anything like that, we need to ensure, are we collecting what we should be collecting? Are we collecting more than that? Are we disposing of data properly? You know, when we have these this data that we're storing on small devices, are we storing that for a long duration? Or are we, you know, loading it off to another server for archiving? Or are we just deleting right there? We need to consider um, how we're dealing with that data, whether we're sending it out of network, keeping it in. Um, all of these kind of organizational concepts are going to basically lay the groundwork for all of our technical concepts later. So this is very much something that as an API provider really needs to be, uh, you know, contextualized and considered early on in the process. As part of that, uh, we have the next layer, which is really our structural security. Now, this is when we take all of our organizational uh, security concepts and we start applying it to the API and to the systems that the API rests on. So um, in terms of devices, how much do we allow those devices to talk to each other? Do we allow a major network of devices, which may you know, improve functional, uh, their functional abilities? It may result in quicker processing. But the more nodes you have on a network, in theory at least, the less secure that network is. Um, it's kind of, it's the concept of an attack vector. If we just have one extremely secure device, in theory, that's totally secure. If we have 100 secure devices, we're resting on the idea of all of those devices simultaneously being just the height of perfection and security. That's not really an assumption we can make. So we need to decide that. Uh, we need to decide what protocols we're going to use, especially in terms of what is actually supported by our network. That's going to be a huge consideration when we get a little bit later into this presentation. Uh, we also need to think about our devices. You know, something like an, an EKG, EKG um, unit, those typically have um, processors that are kind of connected to the device, but they're not actually embedded in the body. Um, so that can, in theory, be as big as it needs to be. Um, something, though, like a sensor that's implanted in the brain or an ocular sensor for restoring vision, those things aren't very big. They, by design, can't be. You know, we can't take out someone's liver <laughs> to give them eyesight. Um, so we really need to consider, because of those size limitations, the actual processing and, and things like that. And from both of those concepts, we get into the technical security concept. Um, and this is really informed, again, by the previous two. And this is when we start talking about how do we actually secure data? How do we actually encrypt it? 
Um, this is when we start talking about things like OAuth. This is when we start considering public key infrastructure. Um, do we do just simple kind of asymmetric keys or symmetric keys? How do we, you know, design that? Are we just going to be using API keys? Are we going to be using a different encryption standard because our protocol doesn't necessarily support it? A good example of this would be TLS and IPsec or IP security. Those are very powerful solutions, but not every implementation that we use is going to be able to utilize um, protocols like that. So uh, we also need to consider whether we're going to have hard code provision credentials, which is great, but um, not always the best for revocation. And, um, you know, all of this, again, is very much defined by what kind of technology we use. As an example of that, there are some devices that use Bluetooth, which is fine. There are other devices that may use cellular technology um, and still more can use integrated SIM chips. And all these things have different levels of security, different appropriate protocols and different appropriate methods of encryption. Um, so all of, the, all of these decisions are going to be informed by our organizational and security choices. So the question is, what's the best solution? Unfortunately, there's not really going to be a best solution that is 100% covering, but we can kind of get close to that. Um, so I break this down into five considerations. First off, our, our solution has to be small. We basically, in an IoT situation with medical grade, we have to go for the smallest device that we're going to see in the network. We can't just design for the giant MRI machine that has all the processing and everything attached to it with you know, a traditional computer. We have to go, what's the smallest we can go? What is the most appropriate for the given use case? We also need to have an efficient solution because space is at a premium, so is processing power. We're not always going to have a 16 core behemoth, you know, whatever processor to do whatever we need. And in some cases, we may have a system on a chip that is very, very small, very lightweight, and, you know, does not use a lot of processing power. Oh. Sorry, strange. Um, we also need to have a, rev a revocable solution. Uh, you can update hard-coded uh, implementations, that's fine, but that often includes surgery or invasive placement of uh, nodes that actually communicate via wireless. And so the best option for us is going to be some kind of wireless updating independent of any hard-coded solutions. Not that hard-coded solutions are always wrong, but in my opinion, I think they cause more problems than, than solutions. We need to be able to monitor our solution. That's a big, big thing. These devices are going to be in people for sometimes 10 to 15 years. We need to be able to monitor to make sure that they're working correctly. And fundamentally, the most important, in my opinion, is having a solution that works within your given network. We could have the best system in the world, but unless it works nicely with your network, it's uh, you might as well not have a solution. So I've been talking kind of high level so far. Let me give you some actionable um, choices as to what you might choose to use given your situation. Um, some of this was talked a little bit about um, already, but let me just kind of give an, an overview. Um, Jots is a great option. They're extremely mobile. They are based entirely on the JSON scheme, which is great. Um, they're very small because of that. Um, they're very efficient. You know, in theory, uh, you could package everything that you could possibly need in the JOT, uh, which really means that you don't have a lot of constant back and forth talking and requesting. Um, but it is important to mention that JOTs themselves are not necessarily an encryption, although there is an encryption standard, um, which is RFC 7517 they're actually just an encoding methodology. And so when we talk about this in terms of a security concept, it's important to mention that, you know, things like JOTS and what we're gonna talk about in a minute, COTS, they're actually encoding, not encryption, but they're, it's a very important distinction, um, but they can be encrypted. I already mentioned COTS a second ago. This is basically just a CBOR web token. Um, it's a concise binary object representation. So it's, uh, basically takes everything and what would be a JOT and converts it down to a very, very small format. Um, it's extremely fast, extremely quick, uh, it completely skips the base 64 encoding with JOT, um, and it's all in binary. It's very great for very small devices. Um, so JOTs may be appropriate for larger IoT medical grade, um, but when we start getting into kind of what I consider the micro or mini class of device, we're starting to talk about COTS.
So that's the encoding side of it. Now, what do we look at for encryption? Well, we basically have two options. Um, our first option is symmetric. And this is basically when you use the same key for both encryption and decryption. Um, I use a, a front door as an example. Um, they are good. They're not as secure as asymmetric in some applications, but they are relatively lightweight, which makes them perfect for IoT devices, especially ones that don't have um, some of the more important, you know, damaging functionality that is possible. And um, they're constantly being iterated upon. So one example I give here is the Tohoku University Research Group and NEC, which is a big uh, computer manufacturer or electronics manufacturer, I should say. Um, they actually found an AES application uh, that uses 50% less energy, which means a smaller, more efficient circuit, which means a smaller device. Um, so that is definitely something that is kind of a future application. Um, so symmetric encryption is good. A better alternative to that is asymmetric encryption. The problem with asymmetric encryption, though, is that it uses different keys for encryption and decryption, which makes it slower. Um, that also means it has increased security, which is great, but it does also require more processing. So there's a whole bunch of options here. Um, RSA is kind of considered the top you know, algorithm. Um, there's other options here that kind of you know, are alternatives to that. But when we start talking about asymmetric versus symmetric, we're really talking about a trade-off between speed and security. Symmetric is going to be very fast, very lightweight, but unfortunately, it's not very secure. You know, if I come into your house and I take your house key and then leave, I'm always going to have access to your house unless you change the lock. In an asymmetric kind of kind of case, you would have a different key for when you leave the house than when you come in. It's what I consider a decoder ring. Um, so that is, you know, much more fundamentally secure. But at the same time, if you had to solve a decoder ring puzzle every single time you tried to go into your house, there and you get the uh, speed problem. And as we're talking about speed, here is a uh, kind of broad comparison. Uh, the numbers are a little bit small, apologies for that, but this is a performance comparison of data encryption algorithm study by Amir Nadim and others. And you can see that the speeds kind of just vary all over the place. Um, it's really dependent on your network, dependent on your situation, which is why I'm kind of resistant to advocating for one type of encryption or one specific, uh, you know, implementation, because what may be too slow for your network may be just fast enough for, you know, my enterprise network in my given use case. Um, so you're really going to have to find the encryption that works with your particular transit system and your particular level um, of security that you need. A big point of this as well, of kind of a general concept is when we start talking about IoT devices, we really need to consider the idea of proof of possession. Um, so basically what a proof of possession does is it binds a token to a device and gives them that encrypted data so that when the client makes a request for the access token, it includes that piece and it basically says, I am who I am, I should have this, um, I possess this key so that later on that uh, ownership of the token can actually be challenged by the server and said, well, are you who you say you are? Or should you be doing this? Let me let me challenge that. Um, so proof of possession is yet another, like I said, a layered approach. Um, and, and that's really kind of the general concept here is that everything should be layered upon layered upon layered. You should be choosing an encryption that is fundamental to your network that works within both um, your requested levels or your needed, I should say, level of security, but also balancing that against your speed concerns. And you should really be taking this extremely seriously. As I said before, we're getting away from the idea of just a small um, blood pressure sensor and getting to the idea of in the future being able to have an ocular implant that you could theoretically hack into and see what someone else is seeing. So this is these are serious concerns and should be treated extremely seriously. Um, so I yeah. am open to questions. Awesome. Um, yeah, like you said, you're talking about artificial limbs, pain sensing, prosthetics. It's all very futuristic, and you're looking into the future. Um, it's definitely going to be more of an issue because, like you said, people are depending on these devices to live. Yeah, and very important topic. 
and I think it's important to to conceptualize that as well by a lot of us that are over 20 or maybe over 30. When we were younger, the kind of technology that we have now, they weren't things that we didn't even think of. They were things that we may not have even been able to imagine. And so the idea of having implantable right. um, f- sensors for feeling in limbs or ocular implants, they those seem like science fiction. But the reality is that those already exist in some form. The The bigger threat comes in the stuff that we can't even imagine coming out in 20 years. Yeah, that's a good point. You uh, mentioned regulation, um, and we've seen a lot of regulation in other aspects of the API sphere, like in open banking and mm-hmm. um, in Europe. That is having trickling effects into America and South America and uh, around the world. So. My question is, have you noticed any differences when it comes to regulation in different countries like EU versus the United States, for example? Yeah, yeah. Um, So one of the biggest trends that I see, and I think it just comes uh, kind of down to the differences in terms of politically, or I should say governmentally, how it's organized. In the United States, a lot of the data protection happens kind of piecemeal. Um, There's very specific... Uh, regulation for banking that rose out of, you know, different acts that were passed. And um, a lot of that regulation is kind of slowly coming forward. In terms of the EU, especially, the EU has been very forward thinking about their data protective, uh, or their data protection directive. And um, they have very much gone kind of uh, future thinking. Um, So in the US, you'll have a lot of things like you'll have a specific act for this or a specific act for that, whereas the EU has kind of a general protecting protecting directive and then specific um, spheres of that directive are more uh, focused on individual parts. And so you'll see that a lot of the time in the in the U.S. it's kind of harder to figure out what applies to you, um, whether, you know, PCI, PCI DSS applies to you, which is a payment um, regulation. There's, it's, a, it's a lot harder to figure out where you actually sit in the U.S., whereas if you are operating in the EU, you are kind of covered under an umbrella directive. Um, and that is also even more difficult when you start getting into places like South America because they individually have their own federal regulations. Um, they don't necessarily have kind of the same um, trading area agreement that, say, the EU does. Um, so it's very convoluted. Yeah. My advice for that Um, and this is kind of just general academic advice, would be always develop for the most extreme condition. So whether you're operating in the EU or not, you should be designing as if you are, because they are kind of the most stringent of the current regulation, and for good reason. Yeah. My other question, by the way, we're we're taking questions for Christopher right now on live chat and some discussion around Jakob's presentation, which is great. And if anyone has any other further questions, we'll continue to answer them there. Um, I think just to tie the two presentations together, maybe we could get Jakob and Christopher uh, on board a little bit more together. It seems like um, the world of potential cyber terrorism uh, is like a potential downside of not securing your APIs properly. So, um, how, perhaps for Jakob, how do you see um, these two worlds kind of working in tandem with IoT security? Um, maybe if, is there a different approach when you're using COTS versus JOTS, for example? Yeah. And how does OAuth and OpenID, you know, enhance what Christopher is talking about with encryption? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, the COTS or CWTs, they're, they're part of the spec called ACE, which is a sort of an attempt or a very good attempt, I should say, to make OAuth for IoT. So it's really taking the exact same principles, but sort of yeah, massaging it to be more suitable for constrained environments and the, the problems that Christopher were describing. And 
so I think I think these things are coming together. But but the main point I think also is that they're coming together in a way where you can't separate. I mean, it's going to be your mobile app that's going to talk to an API, that's going to talk to a device, that's going to talk to some other device. So you can't really say that we have this system for constrained devices and this system for non-constrained. You need to have a system that can sort of span overall. So the architectural problem there is is, is quite big, and I you need to take all these small steps on all areas to sort of reach reach this secure solution in the end, I think. Yeah, interesting. Um, and I guess the one last question for you, Christopher. Um, I've come to rely on your knowledge on cybersecurity and you're, uh, you're pretty plugged into the different exploits and vulner uh, vulnerabilities that are being published. It seems like uh, since this is such a touchy subject with the IoT, uh, quite literally, in some cases with medical, um, can you for recent exploits that have hit the news that are like really relevant to what you're talking about, other than the the pacemaker? Yeah. So it's exploit. actually it's actually kind of interesting when we. And this is just kind of a general commentary, I should say. Uh, when we talk about these sort of exploits, we often talk about them as the biggest financial exploit or the biggest, you know, um, when uh, there was just a sea cleaner exploit where a bunch of people's computers got exposed um, and there was, you know, all these different kinds of programs. We tend to talk about them segmented because it's easier to segment them out into their respective industries. But the fact is that all of these things are based on the same fundamental nature of the internet and the same fundamental nature of data transfer. And so what I always say with this kind of question is from a purely academic standpoint, there is no difference between the heart bleed um, issue or the sea cleaner issue or the um, big, you know, social security um, exposure through, I think it was Equifax, uh, big financial, you know, thing. All of these things, they're part of different industries, but they're all part of the same fundamental lack of security that we seem to have going forward. And I think the, the reason behind that, which is always kind of the follow-up question, well, why are things less secure? Why is this happening more often? We have to remember that when the internet was built, there were still things in the DARPA labs that were using vacuum tubes. We were still very limited in terms of, you know, the we still had governmental agencies using these kind of, you know, ENIAC kind of things. We're in the case now where the computer that I'm using right now to broadcast this has 32 or sorry, 16 gigabytes of RAM. It has, you know, a four gigahertz processor. These are things that when I was young would have absolutely blown my mind. A lot of the encryption standards that we have now are not necessarily built with the idea of someone having a literal supercomputer in their palm and being able to crack these things. Um, so as we move forward, we need to be kind of cognizant of the fact it's exactly um, you know what was said earlier. This is not a an, an encryption issue. This is not a protocol issue. This is a fundamental architectural issue with the way that we share data. And as we move forward, I would expect to see going, even more. Yeah. Going off of that, um, how we're sharing data is being disrupted pretty greatly by the blockchain. And we had a on the line. No, someone messaging. Uh, on the chat, wondering for Christopher, with the continued growth that are accessible through these web APIs, how do we see security of such devices, uh, blockchain technology? Well, the blockchain is really interesting because it's fundamentally a mathematical transaction. And so in some respects, that is a lot more secure than other methodologies where it's kind of you trust a server. I mean, that's why when we talk about a trusted agent or a trusted server, we're saying, is this the person that it should be? And then we trust the server to say yes or to say no. With a blockchain kind of thing, it's very much a more distributed version of that. And mathematically, you have to prove that you were part of this you know, mathematical transaction. And so in that respect, it's more secure. The problem comes though, when you have um, individual systems that collate those results or manage those results. Um, a good example of this was Mt. Gox, which was the, the Bitcoin service that got hacked and it was this whole thing. 
blockchain by itself is a promising technology, but the fear is that it's such a young technology, relatively speaking, compared to other solutions that we've had, that I think it needs to go through a little bit more maturity and it needs to go, you know, through a little bit more um, investigation, I, I guess. Yeah, but it is very promising. And I think in the future, especially when we get devices, because that's kind of the the rub of it is that, yes, it is more secure, but you also need to have the power to do that math. And so um, as we get more powerful devices and smaller processors, more power efficient processors, that will definitely be an option. It just needs to mature would be my answer. Got it. Uh, we are getting another question as well. Uh, I think either of you could take this. How is the security of Jot currently? Um, some critical vulnerabilities have been noticed around, such as ALG equals none attack. So does the vulnerability really depend on the specific library which implements the standard? That's a follow-up question as well. So maybe Jakob could take that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, exactly. The, the vulnerabilities have been mainly library implementation vulnerabilities. The alg equals none uh, attack was detected and has been fixed in, in, I would say, all major libraries that I know of. But uh, of course, there's coming up new libraries all the time. But I, I, I mean, the recommendation is use the the biggest library you can find on the language you're picking. I mean, nowadays there, it has become de facto which ones to pick. Uh, but there has been other other small uh, problems with it, but mainly in implementation, not in the not in sort of uh, uh, fact of the job itself. The I would say one of the biggest problems, though, is that you may and I think uh, it was Christopher who wrote a good article about it. Um, when to use jots or not, or why can't I just use a jot? I mean, a jot itself yeah. is a carrier of data in a sort of provable way but it's not a protocol. So it doesn't solve a security issue per se. It's sort of a tool in, in a protocol or a tool in a bigger way of, of solving security. So I think usages of JOTS may be as problematic as leaks in, or, or problems in the libraries themselves. Maybe you want to say something on that, Christopher? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think what it comes down to is kind of the due diligence due diligence of the developer. Um, whenever you start talking about securing your system, you shouldn't just say, I'm going to adopt this library because 300 people on GitHub said that I should. Well, OK, but you, you need to look into it and see, is this a vulnerable library? Has there been any reported issues? And that's kind of the power of, of the job. And in, in terms of this community, this industry, if there is a vulnerability, you better be sure someone will talk about it real fast. Um, so I would say don't allow the pre the kind of previous vulnerabilities of Jots to put you off of Jot. I would say more than anything, the fact that we're even having this conversation about it should be a reason that you should look at it. Um, but you know, again, do your due diligence. Understand that Jots are not encryption; they're encoding. And just as much as I wouldn't encode something and say, "Oh, this is the most secure thing in the world," it's the same thing with Jots. Um, so just be diligent about your implementations, and you should be fine. And diligence is something we really emphasize on the blog pretty often and in your articles as well. Just not bandwagoning on the current trend, the current library implementation, but making sure it fits for your specific scenario. Um, yeah, and a little, if yeah. I can just jump in for one sec, I can tell yeah. you from, because I do a lot of kind of academic research on these kinds of things. And I can tell you that I would say 90, 85 to 90% of the kind of um, exposures or breaches or things like that come from people just blindly putting their faith in something. They say, right. you know, this is the biggest, this company has proven to be awesome, so we'll do it. And then, you know, once the breach happened, someone says, well, I looked at the code and there was a glaring error. It was there for two and a half years. No one mentioned it and they only mentioned it after the breach. So diligence is a big part of it. If you are talking about securing potentially thousands of your clients data and that data could have, you know, multiple millions of dollars in regulatory fines attached to it. And in some cases, their very livelihood. It's not something that you just kind of blithely go, this solution, you, know, you, you, you have to actually think about it and actually do your diligence on it. Of course. So in order to help um, spread knowledge and help inform people, kind of on that subject, we're getting a question. 
uh, what specific skills does one need to join the API security space since it seems to be huge to be a huge business driver? I think this is directed for Jakob. Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> read the and the, and the sad, yeah, exactly. Read the blog. No, and the sad answer is, of, of course, also experience. But I mean, what where where I started and where many started is you you sort of start with start with a security problem. I mean, we have this we have this uh, device or this this API to sort of protect, and where where it's sort of where you have to start is how would you do it by the book. I mean, read read the specs, read the standards. There are good books these days. There's uh, OAuth in Action, for instance, is, is a good book. And there's even the standards. They're actually quite readable, uh, especially the OAuth and OpenID Connect ones. Uh, they're written by by good writers. <laughs> so, so you can actually understand them. Then try them out. I mean, these days, there's also uh, quite some implementations of, of these things to try out and see, OK, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? Um, but I know then also you, you you need to start keeping track a bit on what's what's cooking. I mean, what like Christopher is mentioning, what's um, what's on the agenda currently? What are what are people trying to attack? What are people trying to worry about? Or what are they worrying about and stuff like that? So uh, it's, it's hard to say. There's a yeah, exactly. That's a good question. You can actually you can join the the mailing lists, for instance, on uh, on OAuth and OpenID Connect. They're open by the working groups. You'll hear what's what's being discussed for the new ones. There are some great conferences you can go to. I mean, our, on Nordic APIs, we talk about API security a lot. Uh, it's a good conference for that. But then there's also like the the um, Internet Identity Workshop, which is a good conference if you want to go and and be nerdy about. <laughs> Uh, internet identity standards and stuff like that. I would say that's that's a good good place to start. It's really its own animal. I'm sure, it's related to APIs, but it does require that really specific skill set. Yeah, that's true, and it's it's really needed also. So yeah, more people exactly. to the bus is welcome. So. Well, I think we'll leave it at that for the day. Uh, looks like that's. All the questions that uh, and we've covered them all. So, sign out uh, with my screen. This is just our first of hopefully many future live casts. I love seeing the chat in real time and be able being able to actually talk to the community in a different forum. This is really cool. Um, big thank you to our sponsor, Curity. And they've been helping organizing events from the beginning with Nordic APIs. Um, if you'd like to keep the conversation going, you can definitely follow us on Twitter or involved. We do have a Slack group that is continuing this sort of discussion. So nordicapis.com. And I do believe it requires uh, an invite code, which we can send out in our next newsletter. And lastly, if you're interested in participating in one of these, we're looking for, part for partners to engage in these sort of discussions and lightning talks on what they're passionate about with APIs. So contact us, us at info at nordicapis.com and maybe we can get the conversation rolling. So that's it. Tuning in. And I think we'll just sign off here.